Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. I did think about talking, uh, calling this talk this afternoon, what happens when you're a newly qualified Scrum Master who doesn't really know what they're doing and you're trying to implement Scrum with a team that doesn't know what problem it's trying to solve and is only half a board anyway. Um, but it was a bit long and I didn't know if it was funny, so I won't <laughs> <laughs> um, So here we go, I'm going to talk, tell you a story about um, how we use Scrum in a non-engineering team. So when I was growing up my parents had this cookbook. Um, it's the home pride book of home baking and it was dog-eared, tatty, covered in flour. And it was our go-to book for all of the key recipes we have in our family. So toad in the hole, pancakes, scones. Um, all of those nice homely things that we enjoyed. And at the end of each key recipe, it had this section that was called Doing Even Better Next Time. And, and I really liked it. it. On the left hand side, it said, Was this the trouble? And it listed all these things that might have gone wrong. So, for example, your pastry, this is a pastry recipe, by the way, it might be hard and tough, it might be soft and crumbly, um, all the things that might potentially go wrong. And then it listed the reasons why. So, for example, you put too much water in, or too much fat, or you've handled it too much. And I really like this idea that, you know, it kind of acknowledged that you're probably going to get it a bit wrong the first time you do it. But lots of other people have made this recipe and tried it, and basically they know some of the reasons why it goes wrong, and they're sharing that knowledge with you. And this um, focus on reflection and um, sharing knowledge and experiences and looking to improve it, it's something that I've always liked about Agile, and in particular Scrum. So I'd like to use this um, metaphor today to talk to you about my experiences of using Scrum, and hopefully share some of the things that um, went well, some of the things that didn't go so well, and look at the reasons why. Um, and I hope that some of these things might resonate with some of you today, and if anyone's thinking about using Scrum, and um, particularly in a non-technical team, maybe you'll find this useful as well. So, a little bit about me. Uh, two years ago, I worked at the University of London, and I was on the path to become a project manager. So this is me, metaphorically, on my journey. Um, and I didn't really know much about Scrum and Agile. A lot of my colleagues were doing Prince 2, because that's very popular in the public sector. But I spoke to a few people, and I heard about this thing that people tended to be quite excited about, and it sounded really interesting. So. I kind of decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, become a Scrum Master and, and, and do Agile. Um, so I um, basically taught myself everything I could. I came to this conference last year. I joined a lot of meetup groups in London. Um, and I put myself through the Certified Scrum Master training. Um, and at the same time as I was doing this, I took another role, which was an office manager job. So it wasn't an Agile role. But it just so happened that one of the teams at the company that I joined had decided they wanted to use Scrum. And they said, uh, well, Francis, you know about Scrum. Would you like to help us? And I said, yeah, sure, that sounds good. Um, <coughs> so um, <clears throat> what were the ingredients to this um, experiment that we did? So the organization was a, a startup. So it was an IT startup. So there was a team that was building software of about five people. And then there was a growth team that was basically everyone else. Um, and that's the team that had decided they wanted to use Scrum. And there wasn't very much like um, overlap between the two teams. So the development team were kind of using a bit of Kanban and Lean and so on. But um, the growth team weren't, weren't using anything like that at all. Um, so just so you have a bit of context about the organization and um, uh, why we did what we did. Um, I'll just tell you a bit about who was in the growth team. Um, we had, um, there were five people, we had a PR intern who was um, responsible for updating the blog, um, putting stuff on our website, etc. We had um, a head of marketing, um, who was responsible for promoting us online, um, a agency relations officer who worked with digital agencies using our products, uh, head of developer re relations who worked with individual developers um, using the software, and what was the last one? I think I'm five already. Well, anyway, 
that, that was the team. So as you can see, there's, there was quite a, a mix of jobs in this team and areas of responsibility <coughs> and roles. Um, so why did they decide that they wanted to use Scrum? What problems were we trying to solve? Well, in a way it's quite a difficult question to ask because we didn't actually have any kind of kick-off meeting where we sat down and agreed what problems we were trying to solve, which probably like will be setting off alarm bells in some of your head. But it did come up um, a bit later on through conversations that I had, and the two things that the team really wanted from using Scrum <laughs> was self-organisation and better communication. So um, self-organisation really came from the CEO. He wanted the team to take a bit more ownership of their work and um, make sure they're a bit more aligned um, and the team wanted to communicate so they didn't really have any processes in place that would help them um, keep in touch with each other and it had turned out that you know sometimes they were working on projects at the same time um, but they didn't know about it um, Alan Kelly spoke this morning about synergies and the fact that by having stand-ups people you know sometimes can discover things about what other people are working on that you wouldn't necessarily know if you hadn't had that conversation. So they wanted some kind of process that would help facilitate that conversation. Um, what method did we use? Well, we basically uh, tried to do Scrum by the book. So um, how many people here have used Scrum or are using Scrum now? Like, okay. So maybe about like 75% of you. So this will be very familiar to a lot of you, but those aren't the, the main thing really is that with Scrum you work in iterations so we did two weeks and um, you create a backlog which is what you commit to for the two weeks and then the idea is that at the end you come out with something that's completed and so if you're working in the software team it's a finished bit of um, a finished piece of product that you can potentially ship to customers so what was the result um, this experiment lasted about three months, I should add. Well, some things went quite well. So, daily stand-ups, um, a couple of people have spoken about these already. They're quite a quick win, I think, for any team. And for us, we just set a rule and we said, you know, they're going to start at 10.30 every day and whoever's there, um, can join in, but if you're late or you're out that day, you know, you miss it. And we found it was just really easy to, to get that as, to a part of a regular rhythm of our day um, and got people joining in with it. Um, retrospectives were quite effective because the team had never had a way of sort of reviewing their work before and looking back. And we managed to highlight a few issues through having retrospectives that we might not have um, talked about otherwise. Um, Communication during planning sessions. So this is one of our key objectives, and it's one of the things the team said to me. Um, you know, we really find it helpful that um, during our planning session at the beginning of each two weeks, we get together and tell each other what we're working on, and we share and we ask questions. And that's something that you know they've not been doing before. Um, but what about doing even better next time? What were the things that didn't go so well with this team? Um, so there's, a, there's four things I've identified that were kind of, um, uh, that didn't work so well. So the first one was our planning meetings were quite stressful and ineffective. So I don't know if anyone's experienced a difficult planning meeting before. Um, what, what were the reasons why? Well, there's kind of three reasons that I've pulled out for this team and um, why we experienced this. Um, we had too many work streams and areas of responsibility. I mentioned that there were quite a few different job roles in the team, all with sort of different um, sets of things to be getting on with. We didn't have a product owner, so if you're doing um, uh, traditional Scrum and maybe if you're a software team you, you probably have a product owner who's prioritising stuff for you and feeding it into the team. Uh, we didn't have anyone in that role. Um, and we also, we were trying to use user stories to create a backlog for a sprint but we didn't, um, we didn't really reach an agreement as a team what that meant for us and we couldn't really work out how to use them. 
So um, <clears throat> I'll just look at these in a bit more detail um, briefly. Um, having too many um, work streams and areas of responsibility. So um, during our planning meeting, we were, we were trying, basically everyone wrote their stories onto index cards and brought them along. So we were doing everything physically. Um, and we tried to um, prioritize them according to how big they were and, and how important. But the team found it very, very difficult to do. Um, and part of this was because you know, for example, one of the tasks was updating all the uh, developer documentation on the website, which was quite a big job. And another task was recruiting a designer to um, update our marketing materials. So kind of just completely different types of work. Um, and the people that were doing it found it really difficult to look at someone else's work and say, well, that's higher priority or that's a bigger job than, than mine. They didn't have that sort of overview. Um, so what we learned is that for us, the planning meeting, it was better just to use it as a communication meeting rather than trying to create a priority of backlog. That didn't really make sense for us as a team. One thing that we could have tried that might have helped is create some Kanban swim lanes. So we had a board on the wall that said to do, doing done, and we put all our index cards um, up under to do. But it was kind of a big mess and it was difficult to see what all the different streams of work so one thing that we could have done just to help visualise that was to create um, these rows, so for example recruitment, documentation, creating an agency database, which would have just helped um, people to see what was going on. Uh, the next thing, um, not having a product owner, I think I learned from this is that it's quite difficult to do Scrum, if Scrum is what you want to do, without having someone in that role, so if you can, it's always good to try and find someone. I think in this team, for example, we could have got someone outside the team, like the CEO, to come in and help um, give them a steer, or before the planning sessions, help put stuff into some kind of order. <clears throat> and defining unit user stories. So we were, we were using the traditional format, which says, as a dot, 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 I want dot, 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 so that dot, dot, dot. And the idea is that you think about the end user, so instead of just saying what you're going to do, you think about why you're doing it. Um, the problem is, as I mentioned, it was quite difficult to find something that kind of worked for everyone in the team because they all kind of had different kinds of work and um, we couldn't really find one definition and, and it didn't seem to make sense for some of the stuff that people in the team were doing. So one thing that I did that was really helpful is um, I went to a meeting for the London Agile Discussion Group, which was organised by David here, and um, they had a conversation about what's the difference between an epic user story theme and a task, and it was really helpful because it was a room full of scrum masters, developers, project managers, product managers, etc. And we spent a whole evening debating this, and we kind of came up with something workable at the end, but the main thing I took away is that Everyone has a slightly different definition of things like um, user stories, and the main thing is to find something that works for you and your team. So with this team, the growth team, there was no particular reason necessarily that we all had to do user stories in the same way. Um, we could have gone away and maybe um, tried different things with different people. Um. <clears throat> so. The next thing that didn't go so simply was that the team didn't work collaboratively. So the vision when you're using Scrum is that the team all pulls together to deliver something and maybe job titles and job roles get a little bit blurred because the key thing is that you're delivering something at the end that's finished. Um, but the reality with this team was that it was just a group of individuals working on individual projects. Um, so they didn't really work together on much of the stuff that was coming through the team. Um, so what were the reasons for this? Well, I've identified a couple of things that, that I noticed. Um, we didn't really have any shared goals. Um, and there was also possibly the wrong roles and the skills in the team. So if we um, have a look at the first one in a bit more detail. Um, because we didn't have any shared goals, there wasn't really a sense of the team striving towards something together. 
Um, and we didn't, we didn't have anything to refer to. So one way that we could have done this is by creating some OKRs. Um, has anyone heard of OKRs or used them before? Yeah, someone at the back. Um, it stands for objectives and key results. And the idea is it's a way of um, collaboratively setting goals for teams and individuals. And basically, you have your objectives, um, which is what you want to do. And then you have your key results, which is how you're going to do it. Um, and the idea is that they're supposed to be um, they're supposed to stretch you, so if you achieve everything, they're kind of too easy, and if you don't achieve any of them, you're not being realistic. Um, and at this organisation, at the same time as we were doing the Scrum experiment, um, there was an initiative to create some OKRs um, across the, the two teams, and we had a week where we all sat down in different groups, and we talked about what we wanted to achieve, um, and worked out how we were going to do it and set up some key results. And it would have been really great, looking back, if we'd have aligned that to our sprint planning. Uh, it seems really obvious now, but we didn't. Um, so what I learned, if I was going to do it again, is like, if you haven't got a product owner or someone feeding you priorities, make sure that you identify some with your team. This is quite a good tool for doing it. Um, the other thing was having the wrong roles and skills in the team. So we pretty much just took the team as it was, which was basically everyone that wasn't in the development team, and called them a great team and expected them to be a team. But um, it didn't really necessarily make sense. Um, so this is a situation where we it came up in one of our retrospectives. Um, someone was feeling, you know, a certain amount of... Um, unhappiness and, and, and pressure around the fact that they felt they were just in the wrong place and they'd be better off working with the other team. So we talked about it and we agreed to move them across and um, it was really effective because it just took that away and it just made a lot more sense. Um, so there we go, them across. Um, The third thing that went wrong was that we weren't completing our work within the sprint. So we were planning to do stuff at the beginning, uh, but then we'd come to the end of the two weeks and we wouldn't have completed all of the things that we'd put into our backlog. One of the reasons was that business as usual work was getting in the way. So um, and, and unplanned work, stuff that the team hadn't thought about in the planning session was coming up and meaning they couldn't focus on sprint work. Um, and the other reason that was that the team was overcommitting, so um, they are basically saying they could do more than they really could. Um, I said that business as usual work was getting in the way, but it's possibly a bit unfair because I think everybody always has business as usual and everyone has unplanned work. Um, so for example, um, you know, uh, questions that come in from customers um, that you have to respond to straight away, or um, perhaps issues um, that come up, come through Twitter or something, and you have to uh, get back to people. And the team kind of felt they were failing a bit because they were spending so much time on this stuff. Um, but actually, um, one thing that we could have done um, is just have have a swim lane on our, our Kanban board for business as usual. And just like recognise that we're going to spend a certain amount of our time working on it, so we kind of plan for the unplanned stuff. Um, and you can see here I put a percentage, so this could be anything really, whatever like the team thinks is fair. Um, we actually tried to track um, how much, what the proportion of sprint and non-sprint work was. We used it, did this using a tool called I've Done This, which um, it's a really bad picture. Sorry about that, but. It's an, basically an automated email that comes into your inbox at the end of each day and you reply to it and you just say what you've done and then the next morning it's sent around a summary email. So it's kind of just a really effective way of sharing what you've been doing with the rest of the team. And we just decided that when we replied with what we've done, we just put in brackets if it was sprint or non-sprint. And it was kind of a, a crude way of measuring it, but it was really interesting to see how the percentages vary between different people in the team. So some people were spending like, you 
know, most of their time on non-sprint stuff and other people maybe like 10%. So it's really helpful to visualize that and have some data um, that can help us in planning. <clears throat> and next one is the team over committing. So for those of you from how many of you have um, committed to more than you're actually able to achieve in the sprint? <laughs> yeah, a few of you. Um, so I think this is kind of normal. Um, it's kind of human nature to be a bit optimistic and say, you know, yeah, I can, I can do that. And also, if you're a new team, you don't necessarily have that data or you haven't worked to get together for long enough to know what you can do. Um, so one way that you can help improve this is by tracking your velocity. So we weren't doing estimating with story points in this team, and I think that was probably a sensible decision not to. But we could have tracked it in maybe um, a simple way of counting all the index cards that we get through every sprint. Um, and that would have just helped us have a bit of a figure so when it came around to the next one we could say, oh, we did 30 cards. So 30 again is about right. Um, so moving on to the, the final thing that didn't go so well with this experiment, which is and then the big one, the team became quite demotivated and disillusioned about the Scrum experiment. So the vision was that we were going to use Scrum, like this exciting tool, to solve some problems in our organisation and make us better. But the reality was that the team started to feel like um, Scrum didn't work, or we weren't doing it properly, or it wasn't designed for like non-technical teams. And there was kind of a bit of a low level of negative feedback going on. Um, towards the end. So, what were the reasons for this? Well, the team hadn't entirely bought into the process in the first place, so although there was one or two really strong advocates um, who had convinced the team to do it in the first place, not everyone was on board, and that definitely showed as we went along. Um, there was a lack of trust in the team, so we didn't, we weren't comfortable enough with each other to actually um, talk about what was going wrong. And um, finally, the thought that probably some of you might have been having is that maybe Scrum wasn't the best tool for us to be using. So, <clears throat> I said that, that we didn't have a kickoff meeting at the beginning, and I think that we kind of missed a trick with that because we didn't give the team the chance to um, agree what problems we were trying to solve and understand. Um, you know, what Scrum is and have a bit of context to everything. So I definitely, if I was going to do this again with a similar team, just make sure we all sat down at the beginning and gave everyone a chance to uh, discuss what we were going to do and, and agree to try it. Um, and if I was going to do that, I'd probably start off by looking at the Agile Manifesto. And I particularly, I like the first one, Individuals and Interactions Over Processes and Tools, which I've highlighted here because some feedback I hear is that, you know, oh, there's lots of meetings and Scrum is very process heavy and it's just a bit over engineered. But to me, like all of the meetings in Scrum are kind of designed to foster uh, communication and a conversation. So your planning meeting is to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Your daily stand ups to make sure that the team talks to each other. Uh, your, um, Review at the end is to share what you've done with stakeholders, and your retro is to um, highlight issues and talk about them. So everything is about the conversation. Um, and I think sort of going through this with people like maybe helps them to understand why you have those meetings, and then you can make a decision about whether or not you want them. Um, lack of trust. Um, those of you that have read Patrick Lansini's Five Dysfunction of the Team will know that this kind of um, underpins a lot of other issues in teams, and I know um, a couple of people have mentioned this already today. Um, but if you don't trust each other as a team and you don't feel comfortable talking to each other, then you're not comfortable challenging each other or um, giving your opinion. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then people don't commit to decisions that are made. And if they don't commit to decisions that are being made, people don't hold each other to account and say, oh, you promised to do this, how's that going? Or um, why haven't you done this? Can I help you out with it? And 
if you don't have that, then nobody really cares about the result. And I really recognise all of these stages with this team that I work with because we didn't um, build, spend enough time building a team, we were never really going to succeed at the end. So I think building a team is quite a difficult thing and it takes a lot of time. Um, there's a couple of simple things that we could have done that would have helped set us on the right path. So we could have um, just spent a bit more time together socially, going for two lunches. Um, there's a little activity that I quite enjoy doing at Retrospectives, which is you just go around the room and you get everybody to say one fun fact about themselves, like a silly story or uh, something they don't think other people know. It just helps you to like get to know each other and. Um, you know, feel a bit relaxed around each other. Um, another thing that we did in my current team now um, is we had a feedback session. And it was quite difficult actually, but we all agreed that we were going to sit down together and we were going to say one thing that we thought was really good about each other member of the team and one thing that we'd like them to improve. And, and we went away and we prepared this in advance and then we all came into a room and sat down. And it was quite so, so it's quite awkward to start off with because it's not something that's kind of easy to do. Um, but we kind of forced ourselves, you know, say one good thing and one bad thing, and it led to some really interesting conversations. So my team told me, for example, um, I'm not from a technical background, I'm not a developer, so I was always saying a lot, you know, I'm not technical or I'm not a developer, and always kind of drawing attention to that. And they said, Francis, stop saying that, you know, it doesn't matter, you're a scrum master, your priorities are are different and, and don't keep drawing attention to that. And it was really good feedback for me um, to sort of realise how I was presenting myself to them. So it was really helpful and I think that's a good thing to try in your teams, get a chance. Um, and the final thing, Scrum might not have been the best solution. Well, I'm sure there'll be lots of different thoughts on this. Um, and I'll come back in a minute to whether or not I think Scrum works. But I think that um, if we'd have sat down properly at the beginning and, and had that meeting, we might have been able to look at like the different tools, like maybe a more Kanban-y approach. And that might have decided that was more appropriate. Um, but at the end of the day, it probably doesn't, I don't think it matters what we chose. It was more about the conversation um, that's important. Um, so in conclusion, <clears throat> how did it all go? I've just summarised everything, um, and I just go through these very, very quickly. The things that I learned. Um, planning meetings are stressful and ineffective, so you can try using Kanban things to visualise your work. You can go to a meetup group to see what other people are doing and share experiences. Uh, team doesn't work collaboratively. So you can try creating team goals, team OPRs, and maybe try moving people around so you have the right people to deliver um, the work that you're trying to do. Uh, team isn't working, completing work within Sprint, so you could create a business as you could swim lane, or maybe track your Sprint versus not Sprint work using a tool like I've done this. Um, you can also track your velocity to see how much you're actually doing. And if your team becomes motivated and disillusioned, um, you know, have a kickoff meeting or even a meeting. Even if you've been doing it for years, you can still get together. Uh, read uh, five distinctions of the team and try inspecting and adapting your process. <coughs> the title of my talk was about doing Scrum in a non-engineering team. And I don't know about you, but I feel like none of the things that we faced were actually unique to a, a, an engineering and non-engineering team. They're all things that are quite common with any Scrum team. Um, there. Um, just to let you know what happened next, I moved on to a new role at New Voice Media, and uh, this is the team at a recent hackathon. Um, and I became a full-time Scrum Master, um, which is kind of what I've been wanting to do, and um, so reach that milestone. Um, I don't know whether the team I left carried on doing Scrum, but I kind of suspect they didn't. Um, <laughs> we kind of had a wrap-up retrospective, and 
Uh, I didn't get the sense that they were very enthusiastic about it, but there were some things that they did decide they wanted to carry on with, so um, stand-ups and uh, maybe retrospectives, and they could use those when they felt they wanted to. Um, and I'd just like to end on this note, that even though the experiment didn't necessarily work with this team, in that they didn't all become converted and decide they wanted to keep doing it forever and ever, I think that Scrum can work, and it can work if you've got a team with a shared purpose that's willing to give things a go in order to try and improve. So if this sounds like your business or your team, then I would say it's worth giving it a go. And that's pretty much me, so I'd like to open the floor and give you guys the chance to ask me questions about anything I've talked about. And also, um, I'm on Twitter, so feel free. Like, I'd love to hear about if anyone's had similar experiences or maybe what went, went wrong with you and, and some of the reasons why. So. Thanks, Francis. Any questions? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, how did uh, I done this catch things that um, stand-ups didn't? Was, it, was that to do with the trust thing? People were more willing to put things in emails than they were to say it out loud? That's a good question. I don't... I think that we thought about it that way. I mean, in a way, it's kind of similar to a stand-up. Like, you could almost use it instead of a stand-up. Um, but I think it was a, something that the team was kind of already using, actually, before we started to do Scrum. And so we, we were doing that, and we started doing stand-ups as well. So I don't... Did you at any point stop using it in English? No, we didn't. No, we carried on using both. Um, Gives you a record. Yeah. Um, you said it was the business as usual stuff is something you made a note of, right? That was yeah, so that was something that like we didn't track in stand up, but like we could have done if we hadn't have had that tool. We could have um, maybe measured it somehow, like writing it on cards to put on the wall or. Um, so yeah, we, we could have combined that. It just so happened that we had that tool, I think. Um, also, there's a lot of it. You don't want to be spending 20 minutes every day talking about 50 items that came in the POU. You need to be just shove them into something else. Yeah, so there was a, um, a lot of stuff that we would put into that email that we wouldn't mention at stand-ups. So our stand-ups, we just literally said, you know, what we've done yesterday, what we're going to do today, whether we had any blockers. And we kind of tried to stick to that format and not talk too much about other stuff so I think the, the email system was a way of people maybe sharing like extra details that you wouldn't want to spend the time talking about. How long were your iterations? Uh, our iterations were two weeks. Because uh, yeah. you said it was three months and everyone was unhappy at the end of it but usually at the end of an iteration you have a retrospective that lets yeah. them modify the process so that they're happier with it so was there not much of that process modification going on? There was a little you know, bit. You, you imagined after a few, yeah. a few, a few retrospectives of people saying this is no good, you could just can the whole thing, or was it a set time you decided to try it for, despite anyone trying to modify the process by take, getting rid of it completely? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think part of that was comes back to like the lack of trust and the fact that I was quite new to the organisation and um, <clears throat> quite a new scrum master, and people necessarily maybe didn't feel like they could. Tell that me that it wasn't right, going yeah, that well. Sure. I think I think that might honestly be in an element. Um, and we had everyone tells together. me they all shout at me about it. Really? <laughs> about like, it's like, yeah. You know, we have a hell of a retrospective, and it doesn't happen in the next sprint. Yeah. So you're scrum master as well. Well, effectively. Yeah. We do our job. I think it's quite yeah. impressive, actually, that considering that the way you describe the roles and the types of work you're getting are not necessarily joined up. Mm. And it doesn't seem to be that there would be much scope for cross functionality in terms of people having into each other's work. That you have had the same issues that probably most of the scrum masters in the room have kind of been in and saying, Yeah, I've yeah, seen that before. But they were teams who have shared goals, right? Yeah. And yet you still manage to find ways around them by doing just really simple, and you know, not, I don't mean basic as a negative way of saying basic, but simple, basic things to get past that. I think that's quite impressive because a lot of the teams that I've, I've seen struggle and they, they have the luxury of a shared goal so it kind of makes your context even more complex. Yeah, um, 
You're right, and I think that's kind of what I like about Scrum is there is a criticism that for software team it misses out on um, you know a lot of XP stuff, pair programming, uh, BDD, and, and so on, which is a fair point. But I think it's also a strength in that you can adapt it and you can use it in different types of teams. And there's lots of stuff that is kind of easy for anyone to do. Um, yeah. Andy, another yeah, just a quick one. Um, I was interested in your experience. Yeah, you started off by talking about the company having two teams, and yeah. you came into this when you became a Scrum Master. The, the implication was, was the, the software team not using or implementing any Agile? Because my question was about how, how um, it affected or how the other team responded to your, if they were different techniques that you were using, how that worked across the different, the two different uh, sects of the business. Um. So the development team were using kind of more a Kanban approach thing. I think they had a board with like swing lanes and um, it was an electronic board. And they, um, I don't know if they did retrospectives or anything actually, or, or stand-ups even. But um, looking back, it seems really obvious now that we should have joined up, like we could have shared that knowledge. but. Um, And I don't know why that was. I think looking back now, I'd probably question that and say, well, can we learn from each other and maybe share our process? Of... Yeah, another one yeah. over here. Yeah. So um, we know each other, and you know this, and this is not directed to my personal attack on you. Okay, so this is a question that when you said I'd encourage you to have a go at it, to other yeah. people and stuff, there's this one thought that if, if your team, let's say they left and joined another company, and someone said, we're going to start using Scrum. Do you think that they would say, oh shit, not Scrum, because it, I mean, it doesn't work, Scrum doesn't work? And there's kind of a, a feeling that if someone is, you know, I don't know, someone here who's never heard about Agile before, they've come along here because, I don't know, they thought it was free drink or something, they heard about the beach party and they come along and they think, oh, well, I'll just have a go. Expensive beach party. Yeah. <laughs> My concern is that people might have a go and not do it very well, and they're not saying you do it they might kind of tarnish the approach in the whole, on, the, on the whole. So that's kind of that's what you thought about people Yeah. Them. I mean, I think there's always a risk in trying something. And I think if you, at the end of the day, if you offer some value in what you're doing and, and some people take some value for it, then it's has succeeded and there were things from what we did that the team found helpful and um, wanted to carry on doing. So, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really mind if they decide a Scrum is rubbish, if they think Scrum is rubbish but they're still going to do stand-ups and retrospectives and meet once a quarter to do planning because you had a time That's retrospective at the end, didn't you, as well, which probably really helped because then we can talk through everything. Yeah. And what happens in the last three months. Yeah. So I wanted to wrap up because um, I wanted to give them a chance to think about, you know, moving forward. Yeah, what, what they're going to carry on doing. One last question. If you were doing it again, yeah. if you could go back in time to that same point again, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Retrospective thinking then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought terrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think so. Like just sit down with the team and say, well, do you really want to do Scrum? Um, this is what it is, this is what it means. Um, and these are maybe some other things you can try. And this is what the development team is doing. And um, have that conversation I think at the beginning. And if they decide still decide that's what they're gonna do then I would try to help you do it. I think in the same way that you want to try this time around. It's a big, strong test your assumptions, validate your assumptions, etc., etc. Right at the very beginning, get everyone yeah. on board with yeah. um, in uh, Oxford Innovation and a lot of the coaching that we do. Sometimes we're sort of kept away from senior directors because <laughs> they're a bit weird. Um, but uh, which they are. Um, however, it's really good getting them involved quite early getting everybody in and saying, do you want to do it? Is this right? You know, what's what's in it for you? The benefits really sound as though they were kind of missing, but 
but getting everybody to go, what's in it for me? These are the benefits, and listing them all. And they go, cool, easy. Anyway, thank you, Francis. Thank you very much.